This week on the Green Left News podcast, Victorian nurses and midwives reject their latest pay offer, and Palestine's football team faces off the Socceroos as part of the 2026 FIFA World Cup qualifiers, and the campaign to free political prisoners in Russia. podcast. My name is Isaac Nellist and we'll be taking you through three important stories today. Uh, make sure you stick around because we have a great interview at the end of the podcast with Federico Fuentes, who will be talking about the campaign to free Russian sociologist and anti-war activist Boris Kagalitsky, um, who we've been reporting on uh, his case over the last few months on the podcast. Uh, but it's great to speak to uh, Fred, who's involved in this solidarity campaign. Um, But before we get to that, we'll start off with our first story of the day, which is uh, Victorian uh, nurses and midwives who are members of the Australian Nursing and Midwifery Federation, Victoria Branch, voted on the 20th of May to reject Victorian Labor's enterprise bargaining offer, despite the union and the government having reached an in-principle deal. ANMF members held industrial action ballots on April 29 and 96% of members voted to take action from May 7. And so the action they uh, started with stage one, which included wearing uh, red campaign t-shirts, refusing to work overtime, talking to patients about the campaign, stopping work to post campaign messages on social media and implementing paperwork bans. Some workers also wrote messages on work car windows. And once uh, there was no response from Jacinta Allen's government uh, to the stage one industrial action, they implemented stage two, which included closing one in four beds, uh, cancelling one in four elective surgeries and stop uh, holding stop work meetings, which began on May 17. So in response to these actions, um, the ANMF received a new offer from the government and suspended the stage two uh, actions. And a statewide members meeting was held on May 20 to discuss the offer. So this is the offer would last from uh, May, would last from 2024 to 2028, so four years. And it included most of what the union had asked for. And there was quite a lot of support in the room of the meeting. However, once it was revealed that the base rate wage rise had not changed from the initial 3% a year offer. There was a lot of anger and dismay with nurses feeling betrayed and insulted to receive what amounts to basically be a real pay cut. So workers voted to reject the EBA offer. And there's been a whole heap of issues for nurses and midwives um, going back to, you know, the COVID-19 pandemic and, and beforehand even, and with the health system struggling to keep up. So the union went back to negotiations and stage one uh, actions were implemented again. And to put it in context, Victorian police got a 4% a year deal. So uh, nurses are getting e- were offered even less than that. Now up in New South Wales, nurses and midwives are pushing for a 15% pay rise and funding for nurse to patient uh, ratios. So In New South Wales, public sector workers received a one-off 4% pay rise last year, which was after New South Wales Labor lifted the coalition government's uh, 2.5% public sector wage cap. Um, But the reality is that the more than a decade long wage cap implemented by the coalition has had, you know, a long-term impact on pay, which is at the same level as it was in 2011 when the wage cap was imposed. In the meantime, corporate profits share of national income has increased from 20 to 30% in the past 40 years. And the health system is completely dysfunctional with high turnover of staff, chronic excess demand, and a lot of nurses and midwives choosing to work elsewhere. So it'll be interesting to see where these negotiations go, but nurses and midwives in Victoria and New South Wales are determined to you know, get what they deserve, get a fair 
fair living uh, pay arrangement and the conditions that they need to actually do the job that's obviously a really important and essential essential work. Now on to our second story for this episode. Um, it was a moment of much needed relief uh, from the you know the horrors of the past nine months as Palestinians in Australia were able to cheer on Palestine's soccer team, which is called Al Fadai or the Warriors, who were playing in Borlu or Perth against the Socceroos as part of the 2026 FIFA World Cup qualifiers. The Socceroos won the match 5-0 but there was plenty of support for the Palestinian team with flags and chants of from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, heard throughout the stadium. For those who are able, would you please be upstanding to the national anthem of Palestine? Both teams have secured their passage to the third round of the qualifiers, which is a first for the Palestinian team, uh, which is very exciting. Um, but unfortunately, there was a lot of stories of security targeting people with pro-Palestine signs and T-shirts at the game, and some uh, some people had to you know hide their shirts or hide their signs to to get in. the The other big story associated with this is that Palestine's football association president, Jibril Rajoub, was refused a visa to Australia for the match, so he couldn't couldn't show up to support the team. And he said that Israeli pressure was the reason he was rejected. He's actually visited Australia twice before, so it's, you know, it wasn't a problem previously. Um, and Rajub is also the head of the International Olympic Committee and the secretary of the Fatah Central Committee. And he'd actually been held in Israeli prisons previously before being released in a prisoner swap deal in the 80s. An Australian Palestine Advocacy Network president Nasser Mashni told ABC on June 11 that Palestinians and their supporters were looking for a moment to escape the genocide, to celebrate sport, to celebrate humanity, and to see how the world game is played here. He said, Rajub's visa denial was a kick in the guts. So to put it in context, Amnesty International on the 3rd of June said that Australia had denied over 4,600 Palestinian tourist visas which is a 60% rejection rate. And shockingly, only 340 Palestinians have arrived in Australia since October. Now, a lot of people have pointed out there's pretty clear contrast with how Ukrainian solidarity was encouraged after the Russian invasion, including uh, in Perth, a minute silence was held at a Perth glory game, and FIFA immediately sanctioned Russia as well. Um, now, Rajub is one of many along with former Socceroo and human rights advocate Craig Foster, who are campaigning for FIFA to kick Israel out of international football. Around 300 athletes, uh, who are mostly football players, have already been killed in the genocide in Gaza, and more than 55 sports facilities have been destroyed by Israel's attacks. So I think this, you know, this story really shows you know, the, the light and the darkness of the situation that's happening at the moment. Um, with some great cause for celebration, but also a lot of uh, underlying horrors as well. So we've been following the campaign to free uh, Russian sociologist and anti-war activist Boris Kagalitsky on the podcast and in the pages of Green Left since he was initially charged with uh, justifying terrorism by Russian authorities in July last year. And now on June 5, Kagalitsky's appeal uh, against his five-year jail time was rejected by the Russian court. And Kagalitsky is one of many uh, anti-war Russians. There's about 20,000 who have been targeted since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And many have been labeled as extremists or terrorists. And so today we're joined by Federico Fuentes, who's a journalist with Green Left and Links International Journal of Socialist Renewal, and has been involved in the International Solidarity Campaign to free Boris Kagalitsky. So thanks for coming on the podcast. Oh, thank you for the opportunity to speak about this campaign. Yeah, no worries. It's a really important uh, issue. And I guess to start off, I was going to ask if just for a brief background on who is Boris Kagalitsky and why has he been targeted by the Russian authorities at the moment? 
Yeah, Boris Kagalitsky uh, has a long history of involvement in the Russian left, uh, dating back to the Soviet Union times. Uh, back in the 80s, he played an important role in sort of uh, the emergence of left-wing currents uh, at that time within the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Uh, then he played an important role uh, in leading left resistance to the collapse of the Soviet Union and the incoming Yeltsin regime. And ever since then, he's continued to be a, a thorn in the side uh, of, of, the, of the Russian government. Uh, as a result of this, he's probably become, I would say, arguably the most prominent, certainly Marxist, um, but in general radical left activist in, in Russia. So when he speaks, he speaks with a lot of authority and he speaks not just on his media platform, uh, Rabcor, uh, but also is often invited onto much larger media platforms where he engages in discussions uh, and debates. And what that meant was that when he came out in opposition to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, they pretty much put, uh, put a target on his head. Uh, it was clear that his ability to continue to speak out against the war was going to be heavily restricted by the regime. Uh, and that's what we've seen basically uh, since, the, since the war started with a continued series of uh, attempts to restrict his uh, liberties to speak, um, which have now culminated in a, in a five-year jail term. Okay. And so uh, there's been this international uh, campaign in solidarity with Boris. Uh, there's uh, thousands of signatures on the petition that's been going around at freeboris.info. Um, what kind of support has the uh, campaign received internationally and in including in Australia and what impact has it had? Yeah, I think there, well, there's two things I would say here. Uh, the first is that definitely internationally, uh, the campaign to free Boris Kagalitsky has gained a lot of, lot of support. And I think that's a reflection of uh, Boris's status uh, internationally. So we, you know, in, I spoke a bit about his role in the left within Russia, but internationally, he's also, again, probably arguably the most well-known uh, Russian Marxist. So that's been reflected by the fact that internationally, we've received support from uh, members of parliament, such as Jeremy Corbyn, uh, former French minister, Yanis Varoufakis, uh, French presidential candidate, uh, Jean-Luc Mélenchon, uh, famous academics or writers like Naomi Klein, uh, Tari Kali, um, and here in Australia as well, we've actually gained a lot of support, in particular from uh, parliamentarians from the Greens Party. So we've had various Greens senators sign on to the petition, Greens MPs at the federal and state level have all offered their support, so as independent senator Lydia Forp. So we've definitely been, been getting a lot of support. The petition that was initiated by the uh, Boris Kagalitsky International Solidarity Campaign now has over 18,000 signatures spread across more than uh, 20 translations of the petition. So that gives one small indication uh, of the support. But there's also been other initiatives um, that have been uh, sort of undertaken by different groups to, to express their support uh, for Boris, in particular from many peace groups in, in Europe who have a, a long relationship of, um, with, with, with Boris Kagalitsky. But the one thing I, I would add is that this, this broad support has not only been reflected in the international campaign, but in some ways what's very important about this campaign is that it's been reflected in the, the, the coming together of various strands of the left within Russia to campaign uh, obviously for the freedom for Boris Kagalitsky, but for all political prisoners. So the campaign in itself has not just been a, you know, a general expression of solidarity, but has actually become a sort of a centre of organising uh, for, for socialists, for radicals uh, in Russia itself. Uh, and I think that's a very important aspect of, of the campaign, uh, particularly in light of the, the heavy restrictions that exist in Russia for political campaigning. And the importance that the, the, the issue of political prisoners has taken within, within Russia itself, where one of the important ways where anti-war sentiment is expressed nowadays, uh, you know, which is very difficult, basically banned in Russia, is, for instance, through groups getting together to do letter-writing campaigns for political prisoners. So all of this, you know, I think the, the, the international campaign for Boris Kaglitsky has been uh, part of helping to, for that to, to foster and develop uh, inside Russia as well. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think the the broader aspect of all the other political prisoners as well has has been an important part of the campaign, as you mentioned. So the latest kind of we've heard is that Boris Kagalitsky's appeal has been rejected by the court. 
Um, so I guess what does that mean for Boris going forward, but also I guess for this this broader campaign? Yeah, look, I, I think the reality was that, in, you know, obviously we wanted to build as much pressure for this recent appeal, which was basically uh, an appeal to the military chambers of the Supreme Court. Uh, it's a military chambers because he was tried in a military court. Um, you know, this not, it's not that he's been going to a normal court. He's been tried in a military court. So that, that's the sort of route, the, the official legal route that we've had to take. Now, I think the reality is that many of us, uh, you know, knew that this was very difficult in terms of the, the legal route. Um, for a bit of background, Boris was first uh, arrested in July uh, of last year. He was arrested after um, being after a member of Russia's ruling party notified authorities of a so-called uh, of a video that was so-called deemed to be justifying terrorism. Uh, as a basis of that, he was arrested and charged in, when in pre pre-trial detention. His first court case was in December, and in fact, at that point, the the local military court found him guilty, but only issued him with a fine. Um, however, the prosecution appealed, saying that that was too lenient, and as a result of that first appeal, um, Boris was given five years jail term. We then, the lawyer took the case to the Supreme Court, or the military chamber of the Supreme Court, which ratified the, the, that five years. Where do we go from here? Uh, well, I think there's, there's two things, the, well, three things, actually. The first is that um, there are still other legal avenues, even as small as they are, they still exist and are worth pursuing, and the lawyer will be pursuing that. Uh, that's including going to the constitutional court, saying that Boris's constitutional rights have been violated, and there's also the, the possibility of taking his case to international courts. Although, as we know, Russia is you know, far from uh, a country that respects in international laws or, or, or institutions. Of course, the, the second aspect is that we continue to build uh, pressure. Uh, and we understand and we've understood from the start that a, a big part of this campaign is really trying to make the political price as high as possible for Putin's regime to keep Boris in jail, uh, in particular internationally. Now, internationally, uh, you know, obviously the whole issue of the war in Ukraine, Russia's role in that has been a, a point of debate, discussion within the left. Um, because of that, the Putin regime certainly sees some left-leaning or certainly at least some global South countries as being on its side or at least as being tactical allies in, in what it's trying to do in, in Ukraine as countries have been indifferent or perhaps unwilling to, to speak out uh, about Russia's actions in Ukraine. And what we've been trying to do and what we're going to continue to do is to push for um, social movements, political parties, MPs, ministers and even presidents of countries to come out and speak out and make it clear um, that Putin will pay a, a big political price if he doesn't release uh, Boris Kagalitsky. I think the third thing, and you mentioned it before, but I'd like to just add to it, is that from the start, uh, the campaign, whilst Boris has been a central figure of it, has always been a, uh, a campaign that's had it in mind the, the broader issue of, of all anti-war political prisoners in Russia. And I think that's important. I think it's important to, to not um, to, to to be able to use Boris's prestige, um, using in the good sense of the word, uh, his prestige to 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 shed light on the fact that there are many, many, many others like him uh, currently in Russian jails, and every day more and more. And it's exactly what Boris would have done. In fact, it was only. Uh, about a month before he he was arrested, that he himself had written an article about another high-profile uh, political prisoner, uh, a mathematician, Azat, who at that time was spending four years in jail, whose four years term came up, but was arrested immediately on his release and put back in jail for another four years. And Boris said that whilst his case, Azat's case, was gaining a lot of traction because of his role as an academic, his leader in the fields of mathematics, um, so he's got attention from even people like Noam Chomsky, that it was important to not forget the others, and that 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 you know that, that those names that you know that profile should be used to 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 raise solidarity with all the other prisoners, and so that's yeah. also been an important aspect of what we've tried to do with this campaign. Yeah, awesome. And so, as you've just kind of outlined, there's still some avenues to pursue, and you're still looking for more support for the campaign. And the, the Boris Kalitsky International Solidarity Campaign has said it's going to redouble its efforts in light of the uh, um, rejection of the appeal. Um, so I guess 
uh, where can people go to find out a bit more about this uh, campaign or how can they get involved in, in helping out? Yeah, look, the, the easiest and best place to go um, is the freeboris.info website. So that's the official website for the campaign. Um, of course, also Green Left has probably been, I would say, if not the most, certainly one of the most, uh, um, one of the media outlets that has most been following uh, this campaign. So I think also, of course, you know, reading Green Left, even better, becoming a supporter of Green Left and receiving Green Left every week, more than you know, certain to be able to, to keep up to the date with their campaign. And I think that is important because the, um, the campaign is not going to go away. Um, as I said, we had hopes, but they were very small hopes that the Supreme Court might overturn uh, his verdict. And that didn't happen. But that hasn't uh, dampened our enthusiasm to, to continue to campaign. We want to continue to apply pressure on the Putin regime. We want to continue to raise not just Boris's um, case, but the case of all anti-war activists. We're going to continue to do uh, what we've been doing to date, which is, for instance, uh, getting universities to, for, particularly from BRICS countries, Brazil, India, South Africa and China, to offer places for him to come and teach. Uh, Boris was before being arrested, you know, a, a, an academic, and he's already been offered posts from universities in Brazil and South Africa. We know that BRICS summits are coming up in Kazan uh, later this year. We want to build pressure in the lead up to that summit, both the official summit, but also the counter summits or events around the summit held by social movements and trade unions. So that's also going to be another big focus of the campaign. So in order to keep up to date with all of those activities that will be happening, as I said, certainly freeboris.info is one place, uh, but I think probably even better than that is, is keeping up to date with Green Left, which will you know, be, be certain to be covering all, all of that campaigning. Awesome. Um, we'll put all of these links in the uh, description of this podcast. And thanks so much, Fred, for your time. Oh, no, thank you very much for this opportunity. Now, that's the end of another episode of the Green Left News podcast. Just a final plug for Eco-Socialism 2024, which is happening this weekend, if you're listening as hot off the presses as this episode comes out, June 28 to 30 in Borloo, Perth. There's still time to sign up and get a ticket. It's only a $20 or $50 ticket for the whole weekend, uh, and that includes being able to join online. So if you can't make it to Perth, it's not a big deal. You can uh, join the sessions online uh, starting on Friday night, June 28, with uh, you know, a, a really great opportunity to hear from iconic Palestinian revolutionary Leila Khaled, uh, as well as a huge list of incredible speakers from, you know, around the world, uh, India, Pakistan, Brazil, Ireland, uh, Singapore, and a whole heap of other countries. We've got, uh, there's a great list. So if you want to find out more about eco-socialism and get your ticket, uh, head to ecosocialism.org.au. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting weekend and to keep your eyes on the podcast feed as well as hopefully we'll be able to uh, upload some of the sessions as podcasts and videos and check out greenleft.org.au for, for some of that as well. And make sure you head to your uh, weekend Palestine rallies. In some cities, Sydney and Melbourne, they're still happening every week. Um, in other cities, they're fortnightly or monthly, but check the Green Left calendar to find your latest events. And if you like the work that we're doing here and want to help it continue, you can become a supporter at greenleft.org.au forward slash support. It's only $5 a month for the digital edition or $10 a month for to get the paper delivered to your door. Uh, you know, it's, it's uh, cheap as a cup of coffee or a beer. Uh, so and even though it's, we're in the middle of a cost of living crisis, it's great if you can show some support for independent media. And thanks for listening to the podcast.